Six months, 26 weeks, 182 days. No matter how you split it up, hurricane season is when all of South Florida is on alert, when a good plan is vital for storm survival. Are you prepared for the worst Mother Nature will throw at us? Let's make a Local 10 hurricane house call. We want you to be ready. The time is now for your weather authority to get you ready for the 2016 hurricane season. Hi, I'm Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis alongside Local 10's Hurricane Specialist Max Mayfield. Welcome to Hurricane House Call. We are here to get you ready for the upcoming hurricane season. We will visit one of South Florida's hottest DJs, DJ Irie, to see how he's preparing his home for the season and hopefully you get some tips for preparing your own. Also, we're gonna talk about evacuation zones. Do you know if you're in a storm surge evacuation zone? And we're gonna dive into the science of hurricanes, visit a sustained lab, take a look at drones, and also check out the wall of wind. But before we get into all that, we have to talk about the predictions. What could be coming our way? And there are a lot of seasonal forecasts out there. Most of them are calling for near average numbers of storms and hurricanes. In fact, Max, here are the numbers from Colorado State University. Their predictions calling for 12 named storms, five becoming hurricanes, two major, pretty much in line with an average season. It is, and this is what we should think about those numbers. National Hurricane Center Director Dr. Rick Nabb has some thoughts on what we should really be paying attention to. Above average season, below average season, El Nino, La Nina, the speculation over what kind of hurricane season it'll be is enough to make your head spin. Rick Knapp, the director of the National Hurricane Center, has heard all the questions, but offered one simple solution. I have to continue to emphasize to everybody that there's a huge difference between how busy the season might or might not be overall and how bad it might be for us where we live. Seasonal forecasts don't tell you how bad it's going to be, so I prepare my family, my house, the same way every year in case that one hurricane or storm hits my house and makes it a bad year for me. And after living through relatively worry-free seasons for over a decade now, it's only natural that some of us have let our guards down. But now it's the time to get serious and take a good look at what you will do to survive getting hit by the eventual big one. We need to wake up and realize the hurricanes haven't gone away. And if you're new to the area or haven't dealt with a hurricane in a long time or ever, now is the time to get ready for the next hurricane whenever it does occur. Because we all know it's a cliche, but it's not if, it's when. I hope it's not this year. I don't want a hurricane any more than you guys do. You only have to look back to 1992, the year of Hurricane Andrew, for an example of the only takes one theory in which a below average season produced a storm no one will ever forget. Unfortunately, as hard as it is to believe, even Andrew didn't give South Florida a glimpse of the true dangers of a hurricane. People think it's all about the wind. It's mostly about the water. Wind's dangerous and deadly. Water has been the deadliest hazard. Andrew moved so quickly its storm surge levels were tiny compared to those brought on by Katrina. So even those who lived through that storm didn't experience the deadliest aspects of a hurricane. The data show that half of the fatalities in the last half century due to landfalling tropical cyclones in the United States have been due to storm surge. It's the biggest killer. We can avoid fatalities in storm surge if people evacuate and have planned ahead of time. And the reason people are told to evacuate is primarily because of the storm surge, the number one killer in the hurricane. I don't think we really learned that lesson in Hurricane Andrew. I don't think we did either. And so many people, tens or hundreds of thousands of new residents here in South Florida, we've never faced a serious storm surge threat from a hurricane. The only way to ensure your safety and your survival during a storm surge event is to not be there. And there are products that the National Hurricane uh, Center has that people can access to get a visual of what the storm surge might look like for their areas? Yes, this year, 
making its debut operationally is our potential storm surge flooding map. So we're going to be showing everybody where the storm surge and that particular hurricane for that particular advisory could occur. How high above the ground could the water get? How far inland from the beach could the water go? This year, for the first time ever, a national movement urging all of us to get hurricane strong has been launched to make sure everyone in our community is prepared for the season. The hurricane strong hashtag will be all over social media to remind people that we determine how well we survive a storm. The hurricane doesn't get to decide if I am resilient and I recover well after the hurricane. It doesn't get to decide if I survive the event we get to decide if we survive the event, if we recover quickly from it, and if our family members and our friends do the same. So you know what? I think this is a good opportunity for us to show all of South Florida what Hurricane Strong looks like. Absolutely. Are, are you ready? Maybe you already have a strong hurricane plan, but if you don't, we have what you need to know. One of the most important things is your home ready. We went to see the home of one of South Florida's hottest DJs, DJ Irie. He took us on a tour and showed us how he prepares. And when you take a look at this, maybe you'll get some tips on what you need to do to get ready. We drive left, thanks to When the Miami Heat and their fans need a pick me up, the one man they turn to, not named D Wade, is the master MC himself, DJ Irie. Whether performing at the American Airlines Arena, inside an exclusive South Beach club, or somewhere else around the globe, Irie is now a worldwide legend. but he calls South Florida home, which means he's just as concerned about protecting his house as we are during hurricane season. So Max and I hustled to the beach and headed to Miami Beach to help Irie out with his storm preps. All right, Max, we haven't done a hurricane house call quite like this one. Right, we'll see how prepared that he is. All right. Hey, it's the local tent. <laughs> DJ Irie, how how's it going? Good to Amazing see you. Thank you, Irie. Good to see you. man. What's going on? DJ Irie, we are here to help you out. Make sure you're ready for hurricane season. I need that, because I'm never ready. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to be ready, and Max, Max ready. Mayfield is here to make sure I you mean, have everything you need. The legend, you know what I mean? You just, you know, this man has already saved my life. He doesn't even know it. <laughs> this is 92, Andrew, uh, I was here in Miami with my family, and literally every moment of going through that whole ordeal, we were listening to you, you know, whether it be on the TV as long as we could, or on the radio, and just all those updates and everything that was happening. I mean, not only was it great information, but your, your voice is so soothing. We knew we were gonna get through, you know? But it was, it was great. It was the most traumatic thing I've ever been through, ever in my life. This is everybody's dream, living well, right on the water. Yeah, water's right I mean, there. The water's right there, you know? It's, 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 it's really, really great. You know, we got a pool there, and there's a little inlet there for with boat slips and everything. But, um... What does that mean for a hurricane? Well, now, do you know what zone you're in? That's the first thing we always ask people. Looking you know around, I'm probably in the you need to go zone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, looking at this outside area, this balcony and these yep. doors, what, what do you do to shore up this area? Is there anything that you do? Well, you know what? Um, well, I was told when I bought the place that it was it was high impact, impact glass. Right yeah, okay. mm -hmm. so so that yeah. helps. But you know, what? I wouldn't just. I mean, high impact glass is great, but when one of those AC units <laughs> fly through, I don't know how well that's gonna work out. But um, you know, I'd probably you know go with the whole like you know plywood and, and and all that kind of stuff. One thing I like to point out is uh, you know at the bottom of the uh, door here, lip there, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't think that water could penetrate in there. Gotcha. Gotcha. I wouldn't have thought of that at all. Don't forget either. Objects like that, you want to find a place yeah, for those. Yeah, because that would just, just fly away, right? That would become a projectile. I 
know you're constantly on the go. Yes. And you may or may not want car service, <laughs> or you may want to roll in something like this. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
Kurt Summerhoff is Miami-Dade's emergency management director and a major player on the decision-making team that determines which zones should be evacuated and when. These maps, which cover the walls inside the county's EOC bunker, are all part of the process. If we were to get that storm that's coming at us, we're going to look at grid by grid, look at the forecast of storm surge, what grids is it interacting, and then cut out those grids, those pieces of the pie um, for, for our evacuation decision. This is a highly populated area. How Absolutely. many people would be affected in southwest Miami-Dade? Boy, you know, one of the worst scenarios for us is a storm, kind of like a Category 5, slow-moving storm coming from the east or the southeast. I mean, potentially, when looking at some of those directional surge inundation maps, I mean, you just see so much water in, in and around southwest Miami-Dade and then in and along our coast into the northeast. So we could have upwards of, of uh, a million people. That means that could affect a lot of you. But if you're thinking about riding out a storm at home, just know that ignoring an evacuation order is a decision that puts your life at risk. Now, if people make the decision not to go, um, you know, certainly we don't have enough police in Miami-Dade County to knock on every door, but they are making a decision that if they decide sometime later when it's mm -hmm. unsafe that they made a bad decision, nobody is coming to help you until it's safe after the storm to do so. There's a lot of chaos. But let's not dwell on what you won't do. Let's talk about what you need to do. And that's downloading the Local 10 Hurricane Survival Guide and finding your evacuation zone because we won't always be around to show you. So you're blue. in the blue. That's zone E. You're actually not in an evacuation zone, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't prepare. Evacuation D. Did you know that? Nope. Okay. No idea. <laughs> but now you brought awareness, so I will spread the word. <laughs> If you don't know if you're in an evacuation zone, go to local10.com and look for our hurricane survival guide. We'll have that information there. Or Max, people can download the Max Tracker app, another tool to help them out. Now, just because you live in a storm surge evacuation zone doesn't mean you have to evacuate for every hurricane, but you do need to know your zone and know where you're going to go. Great information, Max. We have a lot more coming up. Stay right there. Up next, forget the boogie boards and beach balls. We're taking you to a wave pool where storm science outsurfs sun and fun. Plus, the U.S. Postal Service promises to deliver in the rain, snow, or gloom of night. But what does one of South Florida's largest employers do under the threat of a hurricane? That story ships off next. Welcome back to Hurricane House Call. Here in South Florida, we are surrounded by water. And for all the research that has been done, not nearly enough is known about the interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean surface. And if we're ever going to solve intensity forecasting, we really have to understand what goes on near that ocean surface. And right now, we can't even measure that with the tools we have. And that's why you and our Trent Eric made a visit to the University of Miami, where something new could help in forecasting. For all the bells and whistles we use to learn about tropical storm systems, Mother Nature always seems to keep one step ahead of technology. But believe it or not, a wave pool, no, not that kind of wave pool, is helping scientists at the University of Miami gain important insight into one of the most difficult places of a storm to research. It's called the Surge Structure Atmosphere Interaction Laboratory, sustained for short. And as impressive as it looks, it's churning out some equally impressive data. That's why Max and I knew this was something we had to see for ourselves. Dr. House. Hi. Good nice, to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome. Brian, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. Well, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was going oh, to be. Oh, yeah. We, we got a, a big tank and a big space so that we can do a lot of good measurements. With I can't wait to get inside. Can we oh, yeah. Take a Come look. on, let me show you. Dr. 
Dr. Brian House oversees the Sustain Lab at UM's Rosensteel School, making him kind of like the chief lifeguard at the pool. And while it may look serene now, don't be fooled. A simple flick of a switch brings these 38,000 gallons of water to life. So it turned on the fan now to its sort of a, a low wind speed. Once a single 1,400 plus horsepower fan starts cranking, it takes just a few minutes for chaos to reign. But thankfully, it's a controlled chaos within the glass tank. Right now, we are on top of sustain, and it is loud. The reason being, it's kicking up category five winds, and you can see the beating this house is taking. The main targets of the Sustain Lab are the interactions taking place where air and sea meet, a point that was previously impossible to measure. It's very difficult to get right down at the, in the interface and make these kind of measurements because it's just, it's really hard. Most of our sensors work well in water, work well in air, but they don't work well in the combination of the two, and especially when it's coming, blowing at you know, 150 miles an hour. This pool is no one-trick wave pony as the data mined here helps forecasters and developers in ways they were only dreamed of years ago. So we have a, like a short-term uh, hurricane issue, which is how do you get a better forecast, right? Sure. How do you get a better intensity forecast so that people know when to evacuate and, and right. first responders can plan their activities? And the, then the longer-term question is how do you build better? Where do you build? If you've never seen anything like this, it's because you haven't. Not even two years old, UM Sustained Pool is the largest of its kind, and it's already giving scientists a real-life look into what had previously been the domain of computer models. With the wave tank here, this for once we're finally going to be able to observe some of these things. When it is fully instrumented, it would have pressure sensors distributed around it and uh, strain gauges on it, and then we do um, can can also do high-speed video of it because that can tell you about how it's vibrating and things. And then in the wind speed, we measure the, we're in the wind itself, we're measuring the, the wind speed with uh, anemometers, and we use the measuring the wave heights with, uh, also with, uh, with sonic devices. In the future, the pool will add elements to simulate coral reefs just offshore to see the effects they have on waves that could cause serious damage to life and property. While we certainly want to stay away from real waves like these near the U.S. coast over the next few months, scientists are hoping for a noisy, loud, and successful hurricane season inside the sustain tank. If you had one goal or mission statement for the 2016 season, what's one thing you're hoping to accomplish this year? Well, I think it, it's the, to really get the information needed to make a better hurricane intensity forecast farther in advance. Because I don't want to be stuck on I-95 with a million South Floridians trying to get out of the storm, out of, out of South Florida because we got surprised. Betty, this is really an impressive wave pool and they're making measurements that we can't get from satellite or aircraft or radar. And the more we know, the better the forecasting. It's all in an effort to help keep everyone out there safe. Stick with us, there's more Hurricane House Call coming up. Straight ahead, the U.S. Postal Service is known for speedy delivery, but find out how they get up and running so quick after a storm strike. And learn where in South Florida you'll find hurricane force winds blowing practically every day. Hang on tight, Hurricane House Call is coming right back. Welcome back to Hurricane House Call. I'm Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis alongside our Hurricane Specialist Max Mayfield. And Max, not only do homes need to be protected for hurricane season, but businesses across South Florida need to get ready too. The United States Postal Service is one of the area's biggest employers with over 11,000 employees in South Florida alone. Our Julie Durda shows us how the U.S. Postal Service gets a stamp of approval for preparedness.
Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of the night. The unofficial motto of the U.S. Postal Service is a reminder that nothing will stop the mail from getting to your door. But sometimes, very rarely, even the postal office needs to respect nature's fury when she sends us a package in the form of a hurricane or a tropical storm. When you employ over 11,000 people in South Florida alone, you leave a huge footprint. None bigger than the massive Royal Palm Processing Center in Opelika. Wow! This is huge! Yes, it is. It's wow. 860,000 square feet. We are primarily process packages and magazines in this building. So we have over 1,100 employees in this building, which includes all of our mail processing operations, maintenance, transportation, and support staff okay. to keep this building going 24-7. Operations this large take an entire team to prepare for hurricane season, coming up with every scenario, big and small. We'd rather be ready to go and not have to use it than not be ready at all. We just make sure that every aspect of our operations will be able to get up and running as soon as we can after the storm. And preparing means more than most of us could ever imagine. From a steady gas supply for postal trucks, to water for the employees, and power for the massive plants. Well, South Florida, we always tell you to make sure you have a generator because you never know when the storm does affect your household if we could lose power. This is one of three generators. This is an 800 watt generator to make sure that they don't lose power so you can get your mail. We have another mobile unit, 1.8 kilowatts of power that we can bring throughout the South Florida uh, district and continue to uh, ramp up other facilities when we lose our electrical powers because of a storm. After a potential storm strikes the area, postal managers determine whether service can return and when, knowing that in some cases, failing to get the mail back in your mailbox could be hazardous to your health. Now more than ever, we are delivering packages and medication, and a lot of customers depend on that medicine. Therefore, our employees understand the role that we play. But beyond the medications, simply seeing your mailman or woman back in the neighborhood after a natural disaster is a psychological benefit that soothes the body, mind, and soul. Restore service to the customers as soon as possible because that makes them feel better. They see us out there, they know things are going to be okay. Hopefully other businesses in South Florida will be as prepared as the Postal Service. Max, did you notice our Julie Durda was glowing in that piece? Did you notice that? I think she's about ready to uh, deliver a brand new baby boy. And this mommy-to-be has some tips for you if you're expecting during the hurricane season. As you may have noticed, my husband and I are so excited to welcome our brand new baby boy this summer. Really excited? And while I, along with my fellow future moms, would love to push the pause button on hurricane season, it's just not possible. Happy birthday. Yes, it is. If the winds of a tropical storm reach 45 miles per hour or more, you suggest that they come in, correct? correct. I met with Dr. Randy Katz at Memorial Regional Hospital to learn what special things expected moms should know before hitting storm season with a baby on the way. Mothers that are high risk um, or mothers that are 36 weeks or above in pregnancy need to be very prepared. Uh, the key is preparation and having a plan ahead of time. So those patients need to discuss these things with their OBGYN and make sure that ahead of time, before a hurricane, they know what to do. And it's not just mommies-to-be who may have some special considerations when they're preparing for the hurricane season. That's right. The elderly and those with special needs always need some extra attention. And of course, you can go to local10.com, download our hurricane survival guide. Everything you need to know is right there. When we return, find out why one local university deals with hurricane winds on a daily basis. Plus. Drones, drones everywhere you look, but we'll fly with a new tool that could help forecasters better predict a storm's path.
welcome back to Hurricane House Call. Max, it is difficult to do hurricane research without a hurricane. And almost a decade ago, one South Florida University figured out a way to make a hurricane at a moment's notice. And what they're learning, as Max and I found out, will blow you away. We have to consider ourselves lucky that South Florida hasn't experienced the wrath of a hurricane in over a decade. But there is a place down in Miami-Dade that feels those mighty winds on a daily basis. Max, we're here at FIU where they take studying hurricanes beyond the textbooks and the computers. There is a whirlwind of activity happening here, so let's see if anybody's home. Wow. In operation for over 10 years, FIU's Wall of Wind facility has been at the heart of research to produce better and stronger building materials and shoring up building codes. Even more so since 2013 when the school really cranked things up with its massive 12 fan unit that can whip up category five winds and rain at a moment's notice. Great hey, to see you. Betty, great to see you. Welcome to the Wall of Wind, Max. Welcome, welcome. The Wall of Wind, well established. The big one, four years, going strong. What have you been up to lately? Oh, we've been up to a lot of things. It's really been exciting. Come on, I'll show you. The Wall of Wind has been so successful in its brief existence, it's now a national testing facility through the National Science Foundation. We've reached category three. But the people here aren't resting on their laurels, as things are always changing. Now, Eric, those gigantic Wall of Wind fans, those are impressive, but there have been some improvements to this in general. What are we looking at here? Oh, uh, great observation, Betty. Absolutely. Those big fans, you know we can get to Category 5 speed. That's one thing we had to do. But what we really had to do was more than just that speed, we had to create the personality of the wind. As you both know, you and Max, that there's lots of turbulence. So this is what's called the flow management. This is how we created the turbulence. We see these triangles, that represents roughness features. Think of buildings and trees in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. And in the back, spirals. Put it all together, we've created the scientific atmospheric boundary layer of a hurricane wind. And you can also simulate rainfall, right? Excellent, Max, because as we know, a hurricane brings more than wind. It brings heavy rain, flooding rains, blowing at hurricane speed. So we can put in water into the flow system to make it realistic. What we see as a housing demolition derby is actually helping make our homes a safer place to live. We know there's lots of research going on here. This is a very active lab. We see a structure right here. What's going on with this one? Oh, Betty, you're absolutely right. FIU is worlds ahead when it comes to wind engineering research. So what we're looking at right here is an actual research structure that's measuring information across the rooftop and across the entire building, if you will. And we can bring the roof up and down. Well, it sounds to me like you like to blow things up. I mean, <laughs> the wall of wind is, uh, to the building industry, it's sort of like crash tests are to the automobile industry. Great analogy, Max. Absolutely. If you think about it that way, there's no other place in the world going to these speeds with these realistic conditions to take products into a lab and test it just like that. It really advances the science and advances the product. Max, I don't want you to get scared, but right now we're walking through the graveyard, so I'm going to put on my spooky voice. This is where all the different structures end up that they're testing, and that's not necessarily a bad thing that things are ending up in the graveyard. It's a sign of success in some ways. What are some of the successes? Oh, well, Max, I'll tell you, uh, we've been busy. That's why we have so many uh, materials here. It shows the different kinds of things and testing uh, that we have done in the last several years. So, Eric, the ultimate goal is to improve the building code for everyone? Absolutely, Max. That's what we're trying to do for all of us as homeowners, business owners. If the research here and the information here can then be taken to improve an uh, building code, enhance it, so that more buildings are built better and stronger, everyone wins. And so far, the wall of wind has made everyone a winner. 
by providing important data to builders to help construct better homes to keep us all safe in a storm. And we're not just blowing smoke. And Max, we know that hurricanes can unleash a tremendous amount of energy. It's taken years to be able to build a wall of wind large enough and powerful enough to simulate a Category 5 hurricane. And maybe 12 fans isn't enough. <laughs> They're still tinkering with it, all in an effort to make the research better. Plenty more to come, including a new eye in the sky that will help create better hurricane forecasts to get you out of the way of danger. Stick around. We're back after the break. Watching Hurricane House Call, I'm Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis alongside our Hurricane Specialist Max Mayfield. And Betty, the technology is constantly improving. And as our Trent Eric shows us, drones are opening eyes when it comes to research in the eye of a hurricane. Look, up in the sky, what do you see? These days, you're most likely taking in an eyeful of drones. Whether they're for fun, combat, or commerce, drones are all the rage these days. And now science is getting into the act to learn more about tropical storm systems. Back in the old days, like you know, now, hurricane hunters use P3 aircraft to penetrate eye walls and simply drop probes attached to parachutes to collect data. Problem is, these probes only last minutes before plunging into the ocean missing out on the important information at the surface of the sea. But it's very difficult to get those observations. And the P-3 can't fly down there, it's a manned aircraft, and it's too dangerous. So instead of just giving up, you know, uh, we said, well, let's try to invent or look at some technology that can get us down there. Surprisingly, Dr. Joe Sioni got some help from NASA folks who usually deal in outer space. They said, hey, have you tried this thing called a coyote? I said, I don't know. What, an animal? What, you want me to put an animal? Live animals? What are you talking about? Sioni quickly learned that the coyotes in question were not animals, but drones that, in an extreme stroke of luck, could actually be launched from the same P-3s the hurricane hunters were already using. They use this for ocean sampling. The Navy does. Okay. Um, and when they designed the coyote, part of the engineering spec was that everything had to fit exactly, even weight, form, everything, so it would have to fit in here. So that's why it is the way it is. And this is different than the drop sign. You said this is a five inch. The drop sign is about an inch. Yeah, I would say the drop sign is probably one third the size of this and half the diameter. So now, instead of a simple drop down into the ocean, scientists will get a lengthy and clearer look at the storm's true makeup. So think of a lot of the stuff we have now as a quick look, snapshot, you look. Whereas the coyote is a movie. So you, the detail that you'll see in a movie is going to be a lot more than you're going to see in any sort of picture. At just five feet long and a 30 inch wingspan, these coyote drones will be able to spend almost two hours circling the eye of the storm, giving the National Hurricane Center a critical tool in creating more accurate forecasts to keep us all safe. If we get something that can fly very low and, and stay up for hours, they might there's a good chance, statistically, that they're gonna get maybe winds they didn't see. So they say 100, oh, we didn't see this. It's 110, it's 115. Let's evacuate that area. It can work the other way too. Hey, it's 100, we fly down there, it's really not 100. So th this can give them situational awareness and this is something that the forecasters can use immediately. Back in 2014, NOAA put their drones to the test by sending them into Hurricane Edward and skimming just 400 feet above the ocean. Two years later, the interactive distance between the P-3 and drones has been dramatically increased. We went from about a five mile at max, most, range between the two to over 50 miles, hopefully even considerably more than that. Right now, NOAA has less than a dozen of these drones in their fleet. They can't fly if there's no hurricane. They can get a little pricey, about 20 grand per drone. But when you factor in what's learned and how it can be used to protect our families and our communities, they may be well worth their cost. If we understand better, then we can, put, we can improve the physics of the model. 
When you improve the physics of the model, then you get better forecasts. This might sound expensive, but it's really just a drop in the bucket compared to the damage caused by a hurricane. Science never stops, and neither do we. We'll be right back. Local 10 has you covered in every way possible and whenever you need us. It's as easy as bookmarking local10.com as your one-stop online home for the latest hurricane updates as well as our up-to-the-second radar. And if you're on the go, you can put us in the palm of your hand by downloading both the Local 10 weather app and the Max Tracker Hurricane app for 24-7 information. And of course, follow us on Facebook and Twitter to be ready for whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Welcome back to Hurricane House Call. Max, hopefully everyone has been taking notes and learning a lot. First, do you know if you're in an evacuation zone? Second, preparing. Make sure you get ready before the season. And don't let the number of storm forecast of this hurricane season have anything to do with your hurricane evacuation plan. Bottom line, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. If we live in South Florida, we should never be surprised by a hurricane. Anytime there is a hurricane, there's a tremendous amount of stress. By having a hurricane plan, you can cut down on that stress. That's right, Max. We are all in this together. Hurricane strong, together. For the entire Local 10 weather team, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>